Well, good morning, everybody. We're starting uh, the review today of uh, chapter one. We're up to Daf Yud Aleph Ahmed Aleph. That's 11A1, the top of the page, three lines from the top of the page. We're starting with Reb Hanina Bapapa. We're in the middle of reviewing the different <clears throat> introductions that were given by different rabbis as they began to expound upon the Megillah. So we're starting from Reb Hanina Bar Papa. So Reb Hanina Bar Papa, when he introduced um, his lecture on the portion of the, the Book of Esther, so he would quote from the following Pasuk in the Torah and connect it back to Purim. And this is <clears throat> a Pasuk from Tehillim, where it says, you, move, you, you mounted a mortal over our heads. We entered fire and water. So what does this refer to? This is refers to when it says fire, this is during the, the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And this is when the three were thrown into the fire. Hanani, Meshul, and Azariah. And then when it says water, what does that refer to? That refers to the days of Parai, um, where we know the Jewish people were uh, had the decree against them to throw all the male boys into the water. And what does it mean that you brought us out into abundance? We say that's in the days of Haman. Um, the next one is Rabbi Yechanan. Rabbi Yechanan, when he started his uh, his teaching, he he started with the following verses: the Pasuk in Tehillim. He recalled his kindness and faithful pledge to the house of Israel. All ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So when when did the, all the ends of the world see the salvation of our of our God? This was in the time of Mordechai and Esther, because remember Mordechai and Esther. And the Jewish people were saved in a time where the whole world was under the jurisdiction, under the dominion of Ahasuerus. Rabbi, <clears throat> yes, I'm I'm sorry. Just tell us again what page you're on. Eleven A. Okay, thanks. So now, <clears throat> Reish Lakish, when he would start, uh, he started from a from this pasuk. This is a pasuk in uh, the book of Mishlei uh, Proverbs. It says, "As a roaring lion and a growling bear." So is a wicked ruler over a poor nation. Who's this referring to? A roaring lion that refers to Nebuchadnezzar, right? Because it says about Nebuchadnezzar, the lion arose from his thicket. That, that is a reference to Nebuchadnezzar, where in scripture is referred to as a lion. Uh, what's this growling bear? This refers to Akashverish. It says about Akashverish, and behold, another beast, a second one similar to a bear. This is referring to Ahasuerus. And Rav Yosef taught the following b'risa. He says that it refers to the Persians who eat and drink like a bear and are covered with flesh like a bear and grow hair like a bear and they don't, um, they don't have any rest like a bear. Who's the wicked ruler? This refers to Haman. And who's the poor nation that is being ruled over? This is the Jewish people. Why are they refer to as poor? Because they are poor. Uh, it's referring to when they were poor in their observance of the Torah. And the mitzvahs. Rabbi Laza, when he would start his uh, teaching on the, on the book of Esther, he he would quote uh, the following pasuk from the book of Kehelas, Ecclesiastes. Through laziness, the ceiling collapses, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. So here, how he interprets it homiletically. He says, because of the laziness of the Jewish people, what did it mean lazy? Lazy in that they didn't engage in the study of Torah appropriately, so therefore the enemy of the Holy One, blessed be he, uh, became poor. So this is really um, a reference to Hashem, a euphemistic reference to Hashem, saying that he was made poor, which means to say that when the Jewish people have something negative happen towards them, in the eyes of the nations of the world, it's as if their God is not able to protect them. Now, obviously, it was something that Hashem had chosen should happen to the people. So as a result of the, the laziness of the Jewish people not engaging in the study of Torah, it led to a decree which made Hashem look uh, like he's poor. In other words, that he's not able to save them. And when but it says- But Rabbi, yep. it, it says clearly a poor nation. Amdal. One second. Moshel Rasha al Amdal. So the nation is poor. No, no, we're, 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 we're talking about two different psukim right now. The poor. Oh, you, you, you <laughs> went ahead. I'm still writing. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, the, sorry. Amdal, you're right. Of a poor nation that is referring to the Jewish people. That's correct. 
Right. When, when we move on to the next one, which is Rebbe Loza, he says um, that he would introduce his teaching with the following verse, which says, through laziness, the ceiling collapses and oh, oh, yeah, yeah. The, hands, the house leaks. Now, now, it's... The what's... Limi Mitzvot. Right, no, that's the, no that's... the next one, the next one. Okay. That's the next one, right. I found it now, thank you. No problem. So he explains that there's the, the word the word over there is ba'atzal tayim yimach hamakore through laziness the ceiling collapses. So yes. the thing as follows, right? Atzal tayim is connected to atzlus laziness, and that means that the Jewish people were lazy in their study of the Torah. What is the word mach over here? Yimach hamakore. So literally, it means the ceiling collapses. But mach is also something that uh, is a, a, a word that can can uh, denote poorness, poverty. As the Gemara says, the word mach means poor. As it says, the um, imachum If the person is too poor to uh, for the assessment, this is referring to when a person makes a vow. To pay the worth of some of someone else. Now, yes, the is from your value. That's correct. So, but the word mach means too poor. So we yeah. say mach means poor, poverty, and the ain mekare, right? Ella kadosh baruch hu. And when the when it says mekare, it means Hashem, because we see um, in another pasuk when we talk about Hashem, right? It says that he who roofs his upper chambers with water. So therefore, that's how he interprets this, that of oh, this pasuk that we find in, um, in Kahelas is a reference to the story of Purim. The next one is Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak, who started off and said, Frashir um, HaMalis, a song of a sense. So had Hashem not been with us, uh, let, let the Jewish people uh, declare it now. What would have happened? What would have happened is we would have been destroyed. And Hashem not being with us when a man rose up against us. Now, who's this person? This person is a person and not a king. So it's a reference to Haman. Okay. So this Shir Hamalis, he says, is connected to the story of Purim. And that's what he would teach before he started to teach the book of Esther. And Rava, before he would teach the book of Esther, he used a different verse. And he said, when the righteous are exalted, the people rejoice, and when the wicked rule, the people sigh. And this is a reference, an allusion to the story of <clears throat> Purim, because when it says the righteous are exalted, the people rejoice, as Mark and Esther, as we see in the Megillah, that when they came out um, victorious, and elevated to a, play, to a position of power, then it says the whole Shushan was happy, right? When it says that the wicked rule, the people sigh, this is Haman, because it says when he was elevated, we know that the city of Shushan was uh, bewildered and sad and depressed. So now, Rav Masna, when he would uh, teach uh, the Megillah, he said, he, he would first connect the Pasuk, which nation is so great that Hashem, uh, that, that Hashem is close to it. Um, and he says that this is actually a reference to the, the, the story of, of, of Esther. The Masha explains Sorry, one second, someone's trying to get in. The Masha explains the connection to this is that Haman came along and tried to tell Ahasuerus that the Jewish people, they're spread, they're scattered all over the world. You know, it, 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 they're, 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 because they're scattered all over the world, it's, not, it, it's possible to victor over them and to, to annihilate them, right? And here, Hashem showed that although they were spread all over the world hashem uh listened to their prayers and he and he and he saved them so this reference to who is great like hashem who listens to the jewish people when they call out to him right um so here's an example of how despite them being scattered uh, nevertheless hashem came and he listened to their prayer and he saved them 
Okay, and uh, Rav Ashi says that uh, uh, he connected it to a, a different pasuk, or has Hashem done miracles, etc. And he says that this is something that uh, that refers to that refers to the story of Purim. Okay, now the Gemara continues to interpret the actual verse of the Megillah, and it says Vayhi b'mechashverish. The word Vayhi is made up of two words, says the, says the Gemara. The word is vai, which means woe, and he, which is a reference to mourning. Um, and what's the woe and the mourning? It's the fact that when it says in the rebuke, <clears throat> the teichacha, that you will sell yourselves and um, there to your enemies as slaves, and no one will buy you, right? What happened was Hama made a decree that no one should buy the Jewish people if they try to sell themselves as slaves. So it was a terrible situation and there was really no way out. <clears throat> Shmuel says that um, uh, he would he would introduce the Begillah with the, with the Pasuk. Um, I will not have been revolted by them, nor will I have rejected them to destroy them. Now, what are these different references to their, their allusions to different... Uh, different times when the Jewish people were um, being persecuted. So it says, I will not have been revolted by them. That's in the time of the Greeks. And I'll not reject have rejected them. That's in the time of Nebuchadnezzar to destroy them. This refers to the time of Purim and Haman. Lahav and Brisa to break my covenant with them. That's in the time of the Persians. Um, others have a version that says not the Persians, but rather the Romans. Um, for I am their God, this refers to the times of going oh my God. Okay, so now in the Mishnah, we said that what, in the Brisa that was that was taught, we said that what Lema Astim refers to what the time of the Chaldeans, right? That uh means that I what Hashem what Hashem, when Hashem says he didn't he didn't he was not revolted by them, right? Um, which means to say he didn't completely abandon them, he appointed for the Jewish people at that time Daniel. Hananiah, Mishol, and Azari to save them. And in the time of the Greeks, so there Hashem appointed Shimna Tzadik and Hashemunah Yovanov and Matsyoke and Godel um, to destroy them. Who did Hashem appoint to come and save us in the time of Haman? That was Mordechai and Esther. And what about the times of the Persians? Or as I said, others have the uh, the version that says that it's not the Persians, but rather the Romans. Um, and it makes more sense to say that is because he, it says Hashem appointed uh, the the school of Rebbe and the sages of the various generations to save to send them. And Rebbe was in the time of, of the Romans. Now, for I am Hashem, their God, this is already referring to the future where no nation of people will be able to dominate the Jewish people in the future, in the future redemption. Reb Levi, before he would start, he started from uh, uh, the, the Pasuk, but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the lands, and we know what happened over there. What happened over there is that when Shmuel told Shaul HaMelech to um, wipe out the Amalekites, and he didn't kill Agag, so as a result, Agag had uh, had children, and um, and Haman came from the descendants of Agag. Reb Chia, connected the Pasuk. Uh, moreover, it shall come to pass that what I thought to do to them, I will do to you. This is a Pasuk. Um, that just follows the, the, the command that if you do not, uh, if you do not kill and drive out the nations that are there, then I am, uh, then it's gonna, not going to be good. Right, and then it go, goes and says that I will I will do to you what I had intended to do to them. How does this connect to? Um, how does this connect to uh, the story of Purim? Because um, th this threat was was fulfilled um, in the times of Haman when the Jewish people were on the verge of, of of being destroyed. Okay, going back to the Megillah, we said Vayihi is woe and mourning. Achashverosh, we start to explain. What this name Achashverosh um, teaches us. So it says Achashverosh means he is the brother of the head, and he has the same character as the head. Who's the head? The head refers to um, Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, the reason why he's called the brother of the head of Nebuchadnezzar uh, is because it says um, with regards to Achashverosh, uh, with regards to Nebuchadnezzar, that you are the head of gold. And the reason why we say he has the same character is because. Um, just like Nebuchadnezzar killed Jewish people, so too Achashverosh wanted to kill the Jewish people. 
And just like Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, Ahasuerus wanted to destroy the temple. How do we see that Ahasuerus wanted to destroy the base Hamikdash? The way we see that he wanted to destroy the base Hamikdash is because Kairish, who was a non-Jewish king, gave a decree that the Jewish people should be able to go back up to Yerushalayim and to rebuild the base of Mikdash. But then people um, objected to it and uh, they came complaining. And so uh, they had to halt the re uh, rebuilding of the base of Mikdash. And then it says in the passage during the reign of Akashverosh, at the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Yehud and Yerushalayim and Akashverosh ruled to keep that uh, halt in place to freeze the rebuilding of the temple. So in that way, he he also uh, sought to destroy the base of Mikdash. Now, um, another interpretation of why he's called Akashverosh is because uh, there's the word Shachar in in his word, right in his name. Which you, if you uh, scramble the letters, you get Shachar, which means that in, in the time of Akashverosh, the Jewish pay, uh, the faces of the Jewish people became dark like the bottom of a pot because of his decrees. And Rabbi Yechonet says um, the, the, the reason why it's called Akashverish is because anybody who remembers him says, uh, um, he says, woe upon, uh, upon my head. Like you get a headache thinking about uh, how bad it was. Uh, Rabbi Hanina said that uh, the problem was, every, the reason why it's called Akashverish is because everybody became poor in his days. As it says in the, end of the Megillah, that he raised taxes um, uh, to, for the people. Um, and, you know, these taxes ultimately uh, made everybody um, everybody poor. Um, when we say who Akashverosh, so the Megillah says, when you find the word who, right, it means that he remained wicked from the beginning until the end, right? Just like with Aesop also, it says who Aesop. So that means just like at the beginning he was wicked, he was wicked all the way through to the end. Likewise with Dos and Abiram, it says who, which they remained uh, wicked from the beginning to the end. And Likewise, King Ahaz, it says, Humal Ahaz, the same idea, he remained uh, wicked from beginning to end. Um, Rabbi? Yes. I have a question in terms of timeline. Yeah. Um, so who was the son of Esther who restarted the, the building? So he, the was, he was Daryavish, Daryavish II. Darius. He was okay. So he, he's yeah. So he's the he, because the, well, as you'll see, we're gonna be we're gonna be dealing with the timeline uh, probably today. <clears throat> and there's a, there's another Darius Dariovish, and he was Darius the Mede, um, and th th that's that's a bit earlier before they actually went back to build the base of Mingdash. So um, we're dealing continuing on with the, the, this word who um, it says with Avram Avram who Avraham right now. There, the who means the beginning and the end were alike, just like he was in the beginning, so too he was at the end, which means he was righteous throughout. Likewise, with Aaron and Moshe, they remained righteous throughout. So, so too with David, he remained humble throughout. Um, and um, then the, the, the Megillah continues, and it says, Hamoylech, who ruled. So Rav says that he ruled of his own accord. And some people say that when Rav said he ruled on his own accord, right, um, it, it could be seen as a praise, or it could be be seen as a disparagement, right? Those who say that it was it was praise is because there was no one else that was uh, suitable to be thrown to be to be to be king on the throne as he was. But others say no, actually, it was a disparagement, meaning he wasn't fit, and the only reason why he got it is because he paid for the position. He was wealthy, and he paid for the position. Now, when it says Mehoidavat Kush, there's a dispute between Rav and Shmuel. Rav. Uh, uh, Rav once says that Hoidu is on one end of the world and Kush is on the other end of the world and the other says no that they're right next to each other but I mean look the, the point is really the same they're not really arguing the, the question is um, the question is you know the perspective the, where, where, where do you where do you see it but the point is um, just like as he ruled uh, from Hoidu to Kush so he ruled from the from one end of the world and, and, uh, and to the other um, then there was another, the, um, with regards to Shlai Mahamelech, it gives a similar <coughs> dispute between Rav, <coughs> Rav and Shmuel. It says with regards to Shlai Mahamelech that he had dominion over all sides of the river from Tifsach 
to Aza. So Rav and Shmuel say one says that they were next to each other, and the other the other say that they were they were they were a, a one end of the world, and Aza was was with the other end of the world. And so the point was basically just as he ruled over Tifsach and Aza, uh, so too he ruled the entire world. The Megillah continued and said 127 uh, uh, provinces. So Rav Chista says in the beginning he only had seven, uh, then he had 20, and ultimately in the end he had 127. If, so the Gemara asks, if you're going to learn a, um, a, a teaching from the way it's written, then what about the other places where the, it's written in a similar fashion? So, for example, the life of Amram, where it says seven and thirty and a hundred. What are you going to What are you going to learn? Since obviously there's no there's no uh, there's no drasha. Why are you learning the drasha over here? And the Gemara answers that over here, this pasuk Sheva Ves Medina is extra because we already know he lived, he ruled from Mahayu Bat Kush, which is the entire world. So why are you telling me seven, twenty, and a hundred to teach me that that was the progression? First he ruled only over seven, then twenty-seven, and then one hundred twenty-seven. Now there's a brisa. The brisa says that with three people that ruled the entire world. Who are the three? Achav, Achashverosh, and Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Those are the three. And we bring proofs from scripture. Tesis says at the bottom of the page, a little small Tesis, that the truth is there's another one, and that's Alexander the Great, but he's obviously, there's no reference to him in, in, in the Psukim, so that's why he's not mentioned. But the Gemara is going to go on to mention Sukim, which shows that Acham ruled over the whole world, and Achashverosh ruled over the whole world, and Nebuchadnezzar ruled over the whole world. So the first, the first, uh, the first proof is for Acham, where he would he was uh, searching for Eliyahu and Navi, and he said that as Hashem lives, right there's no nation or kingdom where my master is not sent to look for you. In other words, he made all of them, uh, he made all of them swear. That, uh, that Elio was not there, how was he able to make them swear? The only way he was able to make them swear is if he was ruled over them. Otherwise, he could have said, uh, we're not interested in answering your question. They, they have no loyalty to him. But because he ruled over the entire world, he was able to say that he had not gone to any place. Uh, excuse me. He had not spared any place uh, when looking for Elio and Avi. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, because it says, right, and it shall come to pass that the nation and the kingdom, which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of, of Babel, and that will not put the neck under uh, the yoke of the king of, ba of Babel, which shows us, right, that uh, he ruled over every single place, every every, every province of the world. Achashverosh, um, as we said, right, Mahodavad Kush, right, we, we, so we know that so it's the whole it's the whole world. Here we go over to the Yud Aleph Amun base, and we have over here a mnemonic, which is the initials of Shlema, Sancherem, Daryovish, and Koresh, right? Because the, the Brisa had said that there's only three people, Achav, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and Achashverosh, only those three. So we're going to come and look at a few others that uh, we consider potential candidates, and we'll explain why the Mishnah didn't include, why the Brisa didn't include them as ruling over the entire, entire world. What about Shlema Melech? That's the first one. So the answer is because his reign was not completed. So he says, well, that for works well with the one who says that um, the whole story in the tractate of Gittin, which talks about Ashmedai, who is the king of all the Shadim, uh, got the better of Shlema Melech and threw him out. Um, and therefore, Shlema became a commoner. And there's a dispute over there what took place. Did he come back or did he not come back? Some say he didn't come back and some say he did come back. So he says, the one who says that he didn't come back, so then this makes sense why we didn't include him. But what about the people who say that he did come back? Why didn't they include If he did come back, then he did complete his his um, his rulership um, uh, and his reign over over the over the entire world. So the answer, the Gemara says that Shleimer's reign was unique, and that's why it's not included in the Mishnah, because when we talk about Achav, who was a wicked king, and we talk about Nebuchadnezzar, we talk about um, Nebuchadnezzar and when we mentioned them, those they, they were only rulers over the over over this world. But Shlema Melech had rulership even over the higher worlds. Okay, so what about what about uh San Kherib? So it, as it says, right, uh which of the gods of these lands have saved their 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 land from my hand? This is when uh San Kherib was mocking. Chizkiyahu and the Jewish people 
um, and Hashem, mocking Hashem, saying basically that uh, no, no, no God could stop him. So seemingly he conquered the whole world. So why isn't he included in the in the Mishnah, uh, in the Brisa? The Gemara answers because he didn't conquer Yerushalayim. Ultimately, even though he sieged Yerushalayim, he wasn't able to conquer it, and therefore um, he's not going to be included as conquering the entire world. Ruling over the entire world. What about Dar Yavish? Dar Yavish says that he wrote to all the people, nations, and languages that live in all the earth, uh, your peace shall multiply. So over there, the Gemara says that there were seven, there were seven provinces that he didn't uh, that he didn't rule over, as and it brings a process, a process to show that uh, there that there were only 120 places, not 127. What about Kairish, uh, where it says in the Pasuk, so says Kairish, king of Persia, all kingdoms of the earth has ever given to me. So seemingly, if that's the case, um, how can you ignore that one? So he says, because really um, he was bragging. It's not, it's not, it's not actually true. Um, he didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't really rule over the entire world. Okay. So now the Gemara returns to the Psukim and says, by Yom Mahim, Shemesh HaMelech, in those days when the king sat, what does this mean that he sat? Doesn't it say after it was the third year of his reign? So the Rava explains that the meaning of when it says he sat, it means that his mind was settled because he was very anxious for the first three years. Why was he very anxious for the first three years? And why did all of a sudden did his mind settle now? So he says, because at that time, in the third year, Ahasuerus said, Bashatar, he made a calculation of 70 years, but he made a mistake. I calculated the 70 years, and now, in the third year, these 70 years are complete, and I've not made a mistake in my conclusion, and that's why now I feel safe. The Jewish people are not being redeemed. 70 years have passed, and now I can be confident that the prophecy is not going to come to pass. So now the question is, you said that Balshatza made a mistake. Well, what was his mistake? What was the mistake of Malshatza? So the Gemara goes on to say like this. It says in the Pasuk, when 70 years are completed for Babel, I'll remember you. It also says to complete the 70 years from the ruins of Yerushalayim. These are two different Pasukim. One is a Pasuk in uh, Jeremiah, ch chapter 29, and the other is a Pasuk in the Neil. And now, and now, here goes the calculation. The first thing is, Balshatzar said Nebuchadnezzar ruled for 45 years. Okay? 45 years. Then his son took over after that, and he ruled for uh, 23 years. So what do you have? You've got 45 plus 23 is 68. Okay? 68, so you're shy of two years, right, to fulfill... The extra, uh, the extra two years uh, that 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 are that are needed. So, what are those two years? The two years are the reign of Balshatza, right? Who reigned for two years? Okay. Now, really, he he reigned a total of three years, but ultimately he concluded that this is seventy years. So, once these seventy years of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar of Bavel, that is, are up, right? And Hashem hasn't come to redeem the Jewish people. So he says, that's it, it's not happening, right? So therefore, he went and he brought out the vessels of the base of Middash and he used them, and we know what happened. Ultimately, he was killed that night, right? Now, before we go any further, right? How, the Gemara wants to know, how does Belshazzar know that Nebuchadnezzar was a ruling for 45 years, right? So he says as follows. The Jewish people were exiled in the seventh year, right? In other words, we were taught a tradition that the Jewish people were exiled in the seventh year, in the eighth year, and in the 18th year, and in the 19th year of the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so the Gemara explains what this means. When we say that they were exiled in seven years, 
seven years refers to the exile of Yahyachin, right? After his conquest of Yahyachin. Okay, so you have a father and a son. You have Yahyachin, and then you have Yahyachin. Yahyachin was um, conquered, right? In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's rule, okay? In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's rule, that's when Yahyachin was conquered, okay? Now, for a few years, for a few years, he um, he served Nebuchadnezzar, but then he rebelled. After he rebelled, right, he was killed by Nebuchadnezzar, and who was put in his place? His son, Yehoiakim. But then what happened was, right, Yehoiakim was then um, exiled in the seventh in the seventh year. Right, which that is the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Because remember, as just said, that really Nebuchadnezzar didn't conquer Yerushalayim and 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 Yehoiakim until uh, his second year. So this is not really the seventh year; it's really the eighth year. Okay. So now Golub Shmoyna Esrei, they were exiled. Uh, the exile of Sitki Yahu place in the 18th year following Nebuchadnezzar's con uh, conquest of Yoyakim. So this is really the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, right? Why? Because we've learned before that what that the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, that's when he conquered Ninveh. And after that, that's when he conquered, uh, in the second year, he conquered Yoyakim. Okay? So now, let's conclude the proof that Nebuchadnezzar reigned for 45 years. It says that it came to pass in the 37th year of the exile of Yehoiachin, king of Yehuda, in the 12th month, on the 25th of the month, that Evel Moradach, who was the king of ba Bavel, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Yehoiachin, king of Yehuda, and brought him out of prison. So we see, we see based on this calculation, that when did Evel Madra, uh, Maradach, take over his father in the 45th year by making the calculation and knowing when Yehoiachim was sent down into exile, right, by Nebuchadnezzar and having a date when he was released by the son of, uh, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, right, which was the first year of his reign, from there we deduce that it was actually 45 years that Nebuchadnezzar reigned. Now, the Gemara says like this. 23 years of Evel Merodach, we know from a tradition. It's not so can we work it out, we work it out from, from a tradition. And then the two years um, of his own reign, uh, this is the 70 years. So now Bashatza says, as since the 70 years have passed, so they're not going back up. So now I can take out the, the vessels of the of the base of just and use them. This is what um, what Daniel said to him. He says to he said to Boshata, um, above the master of heaven, you have exalted yourself, and the vessels of his house they have brought before you. And right after it says that, that very night Boshata, the king of Babel, was killed. And then it's written that the Daryavish, the Mede, received the kingship at the age of 62, at the age of 62. So here we see Balshatza made a mistake in his calculation, right? He made a mistake in his calculation and he was slain. So now, how did Ahasuerus make his calculation? How did he try to avoid the mistake, the same mistake that Balshatza made? So the Gemara says that what happens is Balshatza made a mistake because he chose his starting point in the year of Nebuchadnezzar's race, rise to power, right? Because he thought that 70 years, right, means from the beginning of his rule of Nebuchadnezzar to the end of his rule. And that was a mistake because really it doesn't start from there. It starts from the conquest of uh, the conquering over Yehoiakim. That's what, uh, that's what Ahasuerus said. So Ahasuerus says, I'm going to start and, calc and uh, I'm going to make a calculation and I'm not going to make a mistake because it doesn't say in, the, in Yermiyahu for the kingdom of Babel, right? It says 
for Bavel. What's for Bavel? It means for the exile of Bavel. And how much, how many years has to be deleted from Boshasa's calculation that began with the year of Nebuchadnezzar's ascent to the throne? It has to be eight years. Why? Because it has to start from the Golos of Bavel, not the kingdom of Bavel, but the Golos of Bavel. And when did the Golos of Bavel start? The Golos of Bavel only started when Yehoiachin was sent down into exile, right? If you remember in the Megillah, it says, Ish Yehudi, Hoya B'Shushan Abira, Ushumoy Mordechai, Ben Yoir, Ben Shimi, Ben Kish, Ish Yemini, Asher Hegla, Mirushalayim, Im Hagayla, Asher Haglasa, Im Yichanya. So the exile, right, was together with Yechonia, right? That's when the, the that's when the Golos Bavel really started. And so you've got to take out, uh, you've got to take out these eight years. And so now he says, okay, so the two years we have of Balshatza. Then there was a one more one more year remaining of his reign. Uh, which which Belshazzar didn't include in his in his own calculation. Then you have the five years of Darius the Mede and of Kairesh of Persia, right? Together, ultimate together, they had five years. So two years of his own reign. So you have the seventy years completion of the seventy years from when from the Golos Bavel, which is the exile of Yehoiachin. Okay, and that's what he figured. Because he's made the good calculation. So when it says, when Achashverish was settled, it's because the 70 years, according to his calculation from the beginning of the exile of Bavel, had come to an end. Since Achashverish saw that it came to an end, so he said, now the Jewish people will never be redeemed. That's when he brought out the vessels of the base of English and he used them. So now what happened was, as a punishment for this, the Sultan came and danced among them and ultimately what happened is Vashti was killed. So the Gemara says, one second, didn't Achashverish make a good calculation? He seems to have made a correct calculation. The Gemara answers, no, he also made a mistake. You know why he made a mistake? Because although it is true, it's true. The Golos Bavel started from the eighth year when Yehoiachin was sent down into exile, but as we see from the from the Psukim in Daniel, that when was the counting of the 70 years going to start? It's not going to start from when they, the Jewish people were exiled uh, the first time, but rather when they were exiled the second time, which that came with the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. When Yerushalayim was destroyed, which was 11 years after 11 years after Yehoiachin was exiled, right, which was the 19th year of the kingdom of, of, uh, of, um, of Nebuchadnezzar, that's when the counting of the 70 years was really supposed to start. In terms of what? In terms of the Jewish people being redeemed. Remember, there's two different prophecies. There's one prophecy about Bavel, and the kingdom of Bavel, and that how the Bavel would be destroyed, right? There's another prophecy, and that is the prophecy about how Hashem would remember the Jewish people to bring them back, to redeem them from the exile. So, yes, Bavel came to an end at the end of 70 years from the, the, the reign of of Nebuchadnezzar, right? And then it was taken over by Darius the Mede, then it came up, taken over by Cyrus, until ultimately Achashverosh. However, when you try to figure out when the Jewish people are going to be redeemed and brought back to the land of Eretz Yisrael, and trying to say that once that day passes, then they're not going to be redeemed, you have to know the starting point. And the starting point is not in the eighth year and not in the um, and not, not not in the second year. It when is it? It's in the from the from the nineteenth year, which was the second exiling of the Jewish people, where Tzitkiyo was sent down and uh, and 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 the Beit Hamikdash was destroyed. That is when the counting starts. So the Gemara says, ultimately, in light of this, how many years have to be taken out from Achashverosh's cal calculation? It's eleven years um, between the exile of Yehoiachin and the destruction of Yerushalayim. So how many years did Akashverish rule? It was 14 years, right? So let's try to figure this out. So in the 14th year of his reign, that's when he should have rebuilt the Beis HaMikdash. 
and we find that Akashvarish was not behind the rebuilding of the base of Migdash. So why does it say the work of the of the base of Migdash it was discontinued? Seemingly, he should have given the decree to go back and build the base of Migdash because that's when the 70 years would have been up. So the Gemara says that there were partial years that were con- get calculated as full years, which was a mistake. And ultimately, it's at the end of the 14th year of Akashverosh, once he died and his son, Daryavish, took over, um, that, is, that, is, uh, when, 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 uh, that is when they went back to build the base of Migdash. And so there's a there's a brisa that, that 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 proves that Nebuchadnezzar and his son reigned for a total of only 67 years, not 68 years, as we mentioned before, as it says. And there, yet there was yet another year um, of the 70 for Babel to rule the Jewish people after Boshatza died, and Daryavish came and he and he completed one year there by completing he completed the 70 years. Rava says that the Neil also made an, an error in his calculation of the 70 years mentioned in Yirmiyot's prophecy. As it says, in the first year of his reign, I, the Neil, contemplated the calculation. When he says, I contemplated, you can infer that initially he made a mistake. Um, and then it was revealed to him uh, by the Malach Gavriel. Malach Gavriel, who was sent to him to explain to him how to understand the, the years of uh, that, that are mentioned in the book of Yirmiyahu. So now <clears throat> we're in Dafyid Beis Amad Aleph. <clears throat> the Gemara says, let's try and reconcile two conflicting statements upon which the various calculations were based, right? It seems that Two verses contradict one another. One says, Melois le Bavel, in, your, in your Miyo, it says, 70 years are completed for Bavel, then I will come and remember you. And in the, and in the book of Daniel, it says, um, to complete the 70 years from the ruins of Yerushalayim. So here it, it implies that the 70 years begin when Yerushalayim was destroyed 18 years later. So seemingly, these seem to be contradictory, right? They're giving confusing um information so Rava says one was calculated so that Hashem would remember his people and that's when Kairish gives the decree to go to be- go back up to Yerushalayim and to build the base of Migdash and although it stopped that was enough for it to be considered a remembrance and that was the fulfillment <clears throat> that was at, at least a partial fulfillment of Hashem remembering the Jewish people at the completion of the 70 years for Babel. And that's when Kairish came up and told them that they could go back and rebuild it, even though it stopped. So now, once we mention Kairish, the Gemara says um, about this Kairish, what does it mean when it says that this is what Hashem says to his anointed one, the Meshichai, Kairama Hashem, the Meshichai, the Kairish, that I, uh, that whose right hand I have held. Now, was Kairish really Mashiach? I mean, doesn't Mashiach come from the uh, base David? Well, well, why is he called? Why is he called Mashiach? Um, so, what's going on over here is as follows: the Gemara says the Pasuk is trying to tell us that Hashem was having a discussion with Mashiach, and he com- and Mashiach had said to him, had to, said to Hashem, I'm complaining, uh, Hashem said to Moshiach that I'm complaining to you about Cyrus. Why? Because I proclaimed that he shall build my house and gather, gather my exile. And what did, uh, what did Cyrus do? Instead of going himself to do it, which would have brought Mashiach, right? Instead, he sent the Jewish people and he allowed them to go. He should have himself gone to do what Hashem had asked him to do. But he didn't do that. And as a result of that, he was criticized. To who? He was criticized to Mashiach. Hashem criticized uh, Kairish to Mashiach. Moving on in the Megillah. It says, Chel Poras Umodai, right? The army of Persia and Media, the nobles, etc. And then it's written elsewhere of the kings of Modai and Poras. So which one is it? Uh, who are the kings and who are the armies? So the Gemara says like this. 
they had Persia and Madai, they had a deal that is stipulated with one another. If we're going to be the kings, then the governors are going to come from your people. If you're going to be the kings, then the governors are going to go be from our people. And that's why sometimes it's written one way, sometimes it's written in another way, uh, who's actually the, the rulers. The Gemara continues, when he displayed the rich, the riches of his glorious kingdom. So Rabbi Yaisi, Barchanina said, this teaches us that he put on the priestly garments. How do we know that? Because it says, you court Ferris Guldulasai, right? The honor of a splendorous greatness. And that's with regards to Akashverish. And it says with regards to the, the garments of the Kayan, it's Lechavidulasifaris for glory and for splendor. So this Tiferes is the connecting word that teaches me that what does it mean? It means that he put on the the, the clothes of the of of of, of, of the big dikuna. Okay. Then it says, when these days were filled, right? Only after Hashverish entertained his subjects living in the distant land did he invite the inhabitants of the capital. So there was a discussion between Rav and Shmuel. Rav, a dispute between them. One says, shows how smart he was. The other says, no, it actually shows how stupid he was. The one who says that he was smart, he says he was smart because um, he, he, was, he was smart by inviting the people outside from outside of his uh, of his capital why so because he could appe he could appease the people of his own city at any time he wanted but the people who were far away he had to make sure that they were going to be uh, bought and loyal to him so that's why he made it for them first the one who says now he was actually a fool by doing it this way says listen <laughs> what happens if these provinces rebelled against you right the people who you're inviting rebel against you. If you haven't already made sure that the people of your own province are on your side, who's going to stand up and support you if there's a rebellion? So it was very silly of him to invite the others first and only, uh, and, and then the people of the capital only later on. Okay, so now the Gemara tells us about a discussion between Rabbi Shimon Yechai and his students. It says, they asked Rabbi Shimon by Yechai, why? Uh, did the enemies of the Jewish people, which is a euphemism for the Jewish people themselves, deserve to be exterminated? Well, why did all this happen? You know, um, the Rambam says that if a person sees a calamity happen and just says it's happenstance, it's a terrible, terrible thing, okay? And that's where the source of fasting comes from realizing that what happens is never happenstance. There's always a reason why it happens and we have to do tshuva, right? So the, the, the students of Rav Shem Yechai asked him, why did this happen to the Jewish people, right? What was going on? So he said to them, no, you tell me, you tell me why, what do you think the reason is? <laughs> so, uh, so they said to him, we think the reason is because they derive pleasure from the feast of Ahasuerus. And for receiving, for deriving pleasure of a feast of, of, of Ahasuerus when he was celebrating um, the end of the 70 years and he went out and he, um, and he, he defiled the Caleb of the Beis Amigdash and he put on, put on the Big Dekuna for that, for that alone they deserved, they deserved what, 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 what uh, was decreed. So, so he says, or Shem Ben Yichai said to them, if that's, if that's the case, then who should have been destroyed? Only the people of Shushan, right? The decree should only have been on the people of Shushan. How many Jews came to this party already? You know, the people, the local people. I mean, nobody, nobody came from Australia, right, to, 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 to that party. So uh, uh, no Jews from Australia came. So, so why, 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 why did the whole Jewish people have to be destroyed? So he says, rather, it must be that um, this was because they prostrated themselves to the it, the the idol that was erected by in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, and because of that, that's why they deserved to be destroyed. So now, the students challenge Reb Shimon, and they said to him, "If the Jews prostrated themselves to this image, then uh, why were they saved? 
Why were they ultimately saved by Hashem? So he says, the reason why they were saved is because although they did prostrate themselves, they did it outwardly, but they did not do it inwardly. They didn't believe in it. They had no conviction uh, for it. And that's why um, Hashem treated them in the same way. Outwardly, he created a degree, but inwardly, he never had a decision to wipe them out. And um, as it is written, he does not afflict from his heart, which means to say that although Hashem sometimes does certain things, right, it's not because he wishes to cause us pain, right? And likewise over there, it was just a matter of doing it outwardly, but um, there was never an intention to actually annihilate the Jewish people. Then when we go, when the Megillah goes on to describe the um, the scene of the feast it says, right, Ginas Ebachatzar, Ginas Bisan Hamelach, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So there's uh, different interpretations. You have Rav and Shmuel. One says that the way it worked is there were three locations, right? Those who were worthy to, uh, of the court went to the court. Those who were worthy of the garden went to the garden. And those who were worthy of the palace went to the pa palace. The other says that no, it's that. Uh, initially, Ahasuerus sat his guests in the court, but they couldn't accommodate him, so then he went to the garden, and that wasn't big enough, and so they ultimately went to the palace, and there he was able to accommodate them. And what we learn in the Brisa, a Brisa tells them, tells us that he sat them in the court and opened up two poles for them, one leading to the garden and one leading to the palace. Okay. The Megillah continues that the things that were hanging there were Chor, Karpas, and Tcheles, right? What's Chor? The Gemara says this was a kind of tapestries that were made with needlework um, and they had many holes. So that's the idea of khor, khori, khori. Shmuel says it's actually a white wool that was spread out for them. What's karpas? So he says that this is, this is cushions of fine wool. Then it says, These were silver rods and marble pillars, couches of gold and silver. So here again, we're taught, what, what does this mean? Those people who were worthy of silver would sit on silver couches. Those who were, who were worthy of gold sat on gold. But this is challenged because, you know, why are you going to start bringing jealousy at, at, a, at, a, at a feast that you're trying to, to, uh, to, to, to strengthen your own kingdom? If you start showing any favoritism to one over the other, then people are going to get angry at you. So it couldn't have been that there were different types of... Uh, Couches and those people that deserve to sit in, in nicer ones sat in nicer ones, and the ones in lesser uh, were sat in, 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 in lesser quality. Rather, what happened was is that all the couches were made of silver and the legs were made of gold. What's Bat Vashesh? They were the couches were on pavement of Bat and Shesh. So he says as follows Ravasi said the floor was paved with stones that were much sought after by their owners, which are not easily obtained. And the, the scripture says the stones of a crown obtained after many trials over his land. Okay, what's the Darun Sechores? So he says, um, this were rows and rows um, of these precious stones were inlaid around them. And Shmuel says, no, there was, there was a precious stone um, that's found in the, in the maritime cities whose name is Dara. And the Gemara continues that Hashver took it and he placed it in the midst of the feast that basically illuminated the whole area as if it was the middle of the day time for them. Um, the school of uh, Rabbi Shmuel taught a third explanation that what this means is that Ahasuerus uh, basically claimed an abatement of uh, the sales taxes for all the merchants that uh, they didn't have to pay taxes. So then the Gemara, the, 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 the Megila continues and says the drinks were served in gold goblets, the goblets being diverse from one another. What is it? So it, says, it's, it shouldn't have said Mikhailim uh, Shadim, it should have been Mishudim, Mishudim, which means, which is a, met, a, a more accurate way of saying diverse rather than Shadim, which could be understood as repeating. So it says that Rama said a Basco came out and said to them, and, and said to them, Rish, your predecessors, Bashatza, right, were destroyed because they used the vessels of the of the temple. The Kalim. Uh, right, it says, Mikhailim, Mikhailim, Shoinim, Shoinim, meaning you repeating the same mistake that they made and using the Kalim of the base of English, and you think nothing's going to happen. Well, you're wrong. The royal wine was in abundance. Rav says, if quantity is meant, then the Megillah should have said, Harbe, what's Rav? 
So it's teach us that each person was given uh, wine that was greater than he was in years. So if you were 44, then you got wine that was 45 years old. And what's Vashsil Kados in Ainas mean? The drinking was according to the law. What does it mean, Kados? He says it was done in accordance with Torah law. What does it mean as, in accordance with Torah law? Just as, um, just as the law of the Torah requires that you should eat more than you drink quantitatively, quantitatively. So too at the feast of Achashverosh, right, the wicked one, there was a lot of food, much more than the um, much more than the drink. What does it mean? Ain't oinus without coercion. So he says, Rabbi Loza says, that this teaches us that Megillah, Megillah is teaching us that each person was given to drink from the wine of his own province that he was accustomed to drinking, right? You, okay. What does it mean to according, to do according to every person's pleasure? So Rabbi says, it means to do according to the will of Mordechai and Haman, who would uh, serve as uh, chamberlains of the cupbearers at the, at the feast. Mordechai, as it says, Ish Yehudi, and Haman, as it says, Ish Tzav So when it says, Ish Va'ish, both of these people, Mordechai and Esther, are, Mordechai and Haman, are referred to in the Megillah as Ish. So that's who it's referring to. The Gemara continues, Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal house of Akashverish. So why does it say, Beis HaMalchus? You should have said Beis HaNashim in the women's house. So Rabbi says that both of them, Ham, uh, Akashverish and Vashti, intended to commit uh, immoral acts. And therefore Vashti's feast was held in the king's house in close proximity to the men so that they could uh, ultimately end up doing uh, things that were immoral. And that's what it says. Ihu Bekari Vietisa Bebutsinai. That he, with the large pumpkins, and his wife with the small pumpkins. In other words, that, you know, both of them had bad uh, behavior and bad intentions. When it continues to say that on the seventh day, when the king's heart was merry with wine, the Mara asks, what happened on the days prior? What it took to the seventh day for him to get to, to get drunk? What, what, what was what was what significance about the fact that he was drunk on the seventh day? So the Gemara tells us the reason why it tells us it was the seventh day is to tell us it was actually Shabbos that the, the when the Jews eat and drink and then what they do is they discuss words of Torah and words of praise for Hashem. The non-Jews, what do they do on the seventh? What do they do when they make a party? They eat and drink, and then they start talking about indecent matters. And that's what happened in the time of uh, at the Feast of Ahasuerus. Um, What was going on? So the Gemara records that they were having a discussion, who are the most beautiful women? And everybody was saying that their wife is, the, their, the people of their uh, origins are the most beautiful. So Ahasuerus says, uh, the vessel that I use, which is a way of describing his wife, disgusting way of saying it, right? He says... Um, she what she's uh, called Dian, right? And she's the most beautiful woman. Do you want to see her? So he said, yeah, sure, we'd love to see her. But so long as you bring her here uh, naked. And uh, the Gemara tells us that from here we see that the measure that a person uses, that's how they are judged uh, in heaven. And this is, this is exactly what happened with Vashti. She used to bring the Jewish girls and make them uh, walk around naked and work for her on Shabbos so she was told to come naked and uh, she was it was decreed for her on Shabbos that, uh, that, that, that she should be killed and we will stop here and continue in Mitzvah Shem, uh, tomorrow I wish you all a wonderful day thank you Rabbi thank, thank you, you Rabbi bye bye everyone